So now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome today's presenter, Nami Hawk, Senior Vice President of Ipsos Market, Market Strategy and Understanding. <laughs> Nami, you have the floor. Thanks, Alan, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, so as Alan mentioned, my name is Nami, uh, and why I'm speaking to you today is because I lead a product called Ipsos Essentials. So it's our global syndicated tracker. Uh, we look at the impact of various crises on consumer attitudes and behaviors, and that could include anything from the pandemic to current inflationary pressures uh, and rising interest rates, and um, including uh, sustainability and ESG. Uh, so people's response to climate events, climate change, uh, climate policy, and that's a little bit what I'll be talking about today, is how is that taken into consideration by consumers? How does it impact their attitudes and their behaviors? Before I get into that, um, it helps to understand a little bit about the Canadian context. So what's happening in Canada right now that's going to impact how Canadians are feeling about sustainability, about ESG more broadly. Um, so I mentioned I manage the global tracker. Uh, we collect data in 15 different countries. Data does vary by country. Uh, but one of the things that we're seeing in Canada specifically, um, and it's across a number of our IPSAS products, whether it's our uh, consumer um, confidence index or um, what worries the world or our disruption barometer. One of the things that we're seeing is that Canadians right now are in a bit of a negative space, uh, negative space due to a number of different factors, um, but chief among them is the economy, uh, rising interest rates um, and elevated prices. And so if we look at some data from our essentials program, one of the things we ask is, do you think that whether it's stores, brands, banks, and financial institutions or governments, do you think different organizations are doing a good job of helping to improve your current personal financial situation? What you can see here is that since January, it hasn't been really a great news story. Uh, across all types of organizations, the numbers are down. And if you look at who's at the bottom of the pile, it's stores and retailers, brands and manufacturers that are rating the lowest in terms of helping Canadians uh, improve their personal financial situation. Also worth noting, um, we have a lot of North American uh, companies and clients on the line. If you compare these numbers to what's happening in the United States, these numbers are actually lower. So in the US, uh, banks, financial institutions, and governments tend to rate lower. Um, and stores, retailers, brands do a little bit better. And it's not just that companies and governments aren't helping Canadians. There's also a sense that they may actually even be taking advantage of the situation. So 85% of Canadians uh, believe companies are using inflation to increase their profits, and that's increasing since September. That's also significantly higher than what we see in the US which is closer to 75% of Americans that tend to feel the same way. Um, one more uh, slide on any sort of corporate doom and gloom before we move on. Uh, we also ask Canadians um, if they are worried about illegal actions of companies and governments, and 72% feel that that is a major concern. Um, that number seems really high in the global context of the companies that we track. It's sort of middle lower on the pack. There's companies that definitely fare worse. Um, now, if we move over to the environment, we'll see that climate change is a top concern. Climate change in the environment is a top concern. Fluctuates a little bit, but usually around one in five Canadians, they're rated as a top concern. And when we say top concern, we ask uh, respondents about a number of different things that, that, that may be concerning them. Um, and if it's number one or number two, uh, it gets counted as a top concern. So 17% in our most recent November survey said that the environment, climate change was either the first most important thing or the second most important thing that they're concerned about. Uh, you can see some seasonality to that. 
So in the summer months when Canada was on fire, everyone was seeing smoke outside and we being told to stay indoors. Uh, those numbers were higher and then they've dipped down a little bit since then. And in the context of all the different things that we ask Canadians about that may be a top concern, we can see that the environment or climate rates fourth. Um, that's behind other things like global conflict, the Middle East, um, or Ukraine still making the list, uh, political situation, um, other types of social unrest or inequality, um, but also falls down clearly behind rising prices and inflation, housing prices and personal finances. So you can see in a snapshot from, from this picture that when it comes to top concerns for Canadians, most of them are financial. Globally, environment and climate is the third most important thing amongst global citizens. Um, and that's because housing prices tends to be lower. So that's uh, more of a uniquely Canadian issue and we understand why and in Canada we have one of the highest debt to income ratios of all developed countries and so when interest rates are increasing uh, when people's debt is increasing it tends to be a major concern um, not only that but we also have some of the highest housing prices um, across the countries that we that we survey um, but clearly inflation rising prices is having an impact on how people feel about the environment and how they feel about climate and the actions that they're willing to take. Um, so it's, you know, people do care about the environment, but not everyone is really aligned around um, how much focus it should take versus other economic priorities. So a couple of uh, data points here, 69% of Canadians feel that the environment and climate change issues have been deprioritized because of other concerns. Um, so that the idea of a poly crisis, many different crises that are impacting them, um, again, chief among them economic. And so we see in the second stat there, 57% of Canadians feel the government should focus on the economy first and foremost, even if it means taking actions that could be bad for the environment. Both of those numbers have been increasing since the summer. Uh, at the same time as we see that that concern for the climate declining. So there is a real sense that, you know, we do care about the environment um, as Canadians, but in today's economic environment, there may be more pressing, more pressing issues. And it's not just the concern for the environment. There's also a knowledge gap when it comes to the environment, social issues, governance issues. Um, because when we ask Canadians, you know, are you interested in ESG issues? 60% of Canadians, six and 10 say that, yes, you know, I'm interested. When you move down to, do you have an understanding of what ESG is? That number gets smaller. And if you ask people, do you actively do research into a company's performance on ESG? Are you actively using it in your decision-making as a consumer? That number is closer to a third of Canadians. And so on one hand, we've got the environment again, up against the economy. On the, second hand, on, the, on, on the second hand, even for people who care about the environment, there is a gap in terms of what they can do about it because they're missing the knowledge uh, in order to take action. And so that 30% that actually do the research roughly aligns with a third of Canadians that want immediate action on ESG pillars. Um, so whether it's, you know, the environment is at a critical stage and we must act now, or it's critical to address inequality now, or pushing companies to change now should be the main focus in terms of their governance practices um, and following regulations and laws. It's roughly a third of Canadians that feel that it's important to do so. Interestingly, <laughs> who the onus on, who the onus Canadians put, the, the Canadians put the onus on terms of acting, not on themselves, but on companies and governments. And so if we look at what we're calling the action gap, um, that gap is bigger for companies and it's bigger for governments. So let me explain what we did here. We asked Canadians, who do you think should be taking action when it comes to fighting environment and climate change, um, improving the lives of people in society, improving how closely laws and regulations are followed. Um, and we asked them about government, citizens, and private companies. And what you see here is that the green bar, the teal bar, and the gray bar are very close together when it comes to citizens. So meaning 
citizens feel like they should be taking action, but they actually are taking action. And so they're doing their job. When we look at some of the other bars, particularly when it comes to fighting climate change and supporting the environment, we see bigger gaps when it comes to the government, when it comes to private companies. Same story for people in society, same story for um, governance issues. And so Canadians want action. Um, they're also telling us that they're tapped out and they feel they're doing what they need to be doing. And now the ball is in our court as companies, um, as uh, government organizations to pick that ball up and run with it and do what consumers are expecting us to do to help address these issues. So it's a muddy picture. And when I say a muddy picture, you know, on one hand, we say Canadians care about the environment, but we also say the economy is more important. They want action, but they're not going to take action. They want governments to act. They want um, corporations to act, but also, you know, act, but don't act too much because, well, we also care about the economy. So you can see that it becomes very unclear sometimes for companies, for governments to figure out, okay, well, how do I address these issues and what do I actually do? How much do consumers really care? And that is why we put together a segmentation of consumers to better understand the barriers to action and better understand not only um, how to target Canadians, but who to target with the different messages um, and what percentage of the population that's gonna impact and what are the actions that people are gonna take as a result of that. And so, Back in uh, February of 2021, we developed a segmentation based on a number of variables related to sustainable um, attitudes, uh, attitudes toward sustainability, um, sustainable behaviors. Um, and out of that, we created uh, five segments that um, we vetted globally. So they are uh, consistent across all 15 countries um, where we run our global tracker. Um, and have since been using the segmentation in additional studies, custom studies with clients. Um, and so today, I really want to introduce you to the segments, help you understand a little bit more about them, and hopefully give you a, a sense of, you know, now that if we understand who these segments are and who these people are, how to target them with our sustainable offers. So I mentioned there's five segments. Um, they range from um, all the way from people who don't care about the environment to people who do care and are extremely active. Um, so I'll introduce them one by one. In terms of the less concerned about the environment or less likely to take action, we have disengaged denialists. Um, so they're on the less active side, 21% uh, of Canadians fall into that bucket. And these are people who aren't gonna take action on the environment. And it's either because they believe it's not a priority or there's also within that group a percentage that feel like, yeah, you know what, the environment is, is an issue, but it's too late to do anything. So there's fatalists in there as well who say, you know, it doesn't really matter what I do because we're all screwed anyways. That's 21% of Canadians. Then you have busy bystanders. So they care about the environment. They just have a lot of other priorities. These tend to be young professionals, young parents. They tend to be families with kids, um, with busy careers, dual income households, and they care, they just don't have the time to act. Interestingly, they also tend to feel the most guilty about not doing anything. 16% of Canadians. Um, then you have conflicted contributors. So they care about the environment and they actually have the time to devote to the environment, but they don't have the financial means to do so. And that's 24% of Canadians today. Um, they want to do the right thing. They want to take action. They just can't afford it. So if we can find ways to make uh, sustainable choices more affordable, they'll likely take action. Then we have another about fifth of Canadians who are pragmatists. These folks tend to care about the environment. They tend to have time for the environment and they have the financial means to do something about it. They just don't always have the knowledge to do the things that are most important. They do the things that are easier and, and more pragmatic. Uh, they tend to skew older, so more likely to be baby boomers, and they are more likely to take actions such as recycling, uh, investing in energy efficient light bulbs and appliances, 
um, you know, they grew up with the three R's of reduce, reuse, recycle. So those are the things they focus on versus, you know, driving less or plant-based diets, um, things like that. And then you've got about another fifth of Canadians who are activists. Um, so they're what you traditionally think of as environmentalists. They care, they have the time, they have the, the means, uh, and they know what to do. And so they're the ones that are going to over-index on EV vehicles or not driving at all, reducing travel, potentially not having kids to, to help support the environment, out there protesting, um, running campaigns, etc. So you have disengaged denialists who either don't believe or don't think it matters. Um, you have busy bystanders who think it matters, they care, but they just don't have the time. Um, so think about, you know, what can we do to make it easier, accessible? You have Conflicted contributors, they care, they have the time, they just can't afford it, so it's about making it more uh, accessible to them um, financially. They have pragmatists, they care, they have the time, they have the money, they don't have the knowledge, and then you have activists who are your, as you would expect, um, the, the most <laughs> active, as the, as the name suggests. Uh, if we look at how these have been trending, um, so year over year in Canada, disengaged denialists have been growing in numbers. In fact, you know, directionally, all the segments to the left towards the less active side of things have been growing. Uh, pragmatists um, are down um, eight points versus last year um, and activists down three points as well. A lot of that has to do with what I was opening the discussion with, which is why I wanted to set the context. In Canada, there's other priorities um, that are forcing people to make difficult choices about the environment, about climate, um, and therefore uh, we see a growth in the, the busy bystanders, conflicted contributors as well. Some myth busting about the segments. There's some interesting things we found along the way. Um, did want to point out. One is that being financially comfortable is not a prerequisite for activism. So as expected, you know, we're looking here at on um, the scale is high risk of inflation to you personally. So these are, you know, what's the impact having on on you as an individual, as a citizen, as a consumer? Uh, the bigger numbers means higher risk. And as expected, if you're a contr conflicted contributor, um, you're going to be at a higher risk of inflation. And that is consistent with their behaviors when it comes to the environment. But also, if you look at the next group, um, much lower down the scale, but activists are also at higher risk of inflation, um, but still um, are able to take action and be the most active um, amongst all the groups when it comes to um, uh, comes to activities and behaviors. Um, so again, you know, we, we tend to think of it, especially as part of my opening, I mentioned the, the economy is having an impact on overall Canadian sentiment towards the environment, um, but those that care will find a way uh, to, to make it happen. The other one um, that people also tend to find interesting is that activism is not synonymous with youth. So, uh, you know, even the picture that we had there, it's a, it's a young person that's in the activist group, and we tend to think of young people as being um, more active, more uh, conscious of the environment. Um, and so we say, you know what, the future generation, they're going to do the right thing. They're going to get us out of this mess. Um, turns out not to be true. So if we look by generation, Gen Zs uh, actually have the highest proportion of disengaged denialists. So um, almost a third of Gen Zs fall into the disengaged denialist bucket. Um, it's true they are also more likely to be activists. So 22% of Gen Z are activists, and that's the highest across all of the generations. Um, but it, you know, a good proportion of them um, also fall into the least active group. Uh, so they're divided. Um, they're also more likely to be busy bystanders. You mentioned sort of young, um, younger Canadians uh, with kids, busy families, young professionals um, are going to fall into that bucket. And conversely, if we look to the other side, um, boomers or even Gen X, we may think, well, you know, they're less likely to be activists, um, so we're not going to target them. That tends to not to be true. 21% uh, of boomers identify as activists, um, and a large chunk of them, as I mentioned before, are pragmatists. So those, again, are people who they, they care about the environment, they have the time, they have the means, 
they just need more information about what the right thing is to do. Um, and you can convince them with education, with knowledge, uh, and get them on board to adopting more sustainable offerings. Now, important point I want to talk about uh, as well is the evolution of these segments. So I mentioned we developed these segments in February 2021. Uh, we've been gathering data about them for almost two years, um, but they're largely environmentally focused. And uh, the focus of this webinar series and the focus of today really was meant to be more around ESG. Um, and so one of the things that we'll be doing next year is we'll be adding to the segmentation um, the S and the G. So we'll be trying to understand attitudes and behaviors towards social justice, equality and society, as well as corporate governance, laws and regulations. We're really hoping uh, we don't break the segmentation. So um, a little bit of a look behind the curtain here at, at, at sort of uh, how things are done at Ipsos. Um, we'll be including statements in, um, in, in the survey around the S and the G. We'll be profiling them to make to see if if they roughly align, and then we'll be recreating the segmentation um, so that it's statistically rigorous, and we can type them uh, the, the the segments both on the environment and social justice, equality, society, and corporate governance laws and regulations. Um, what I'm going to be doing for the rest of this uh, talk today is taking you through some of those early findings. So we actually have asked some of those questions around the S and the G, and we can start to profile the various different segments um, along with those new dimensions. And so a couple of things to point out here, uh, activists and pragmatists, um, as we had hoped, uh, they don't only believe in action on environmental issues, but also on social issues. So this time the scale is looking at, um, it's critical to address inequality now. And we can see that the, the two groups that are farthest to the right, that are most likely to say it's critical to address inequality now are pragmatists and activists. So good chance that they'll also be activists when it comes to social issues, pragmatists when it comes to social issues. Uh, similarly, if we look at uh, the scale of I feel bad about how little I contribute to society, the group that tends to be the farthest to the right is busy bystanders. And so you'll remember when we were talking about sustainability, I mentioned that busy bystanders are the ones that tend to feel most guilty uh, because they do care about the environment, they just don't have the time to commit. Turns out it's the same story when it comes to social issues and societal issues. They also tend to feel the most guilty about not being able to take action. And so that, again, you know, if we think about um, ESG offers uh, and, and um, busy bystanders as consumers, you know, we may be able to top, tap into some of that guilt by making it easier to do things um, and giving them a way to feel good about themselves as well. Now we're going to deep dive a little bit into each one of the segments, uh, give you a little bit more data, a little bit more color to who they are. If we start with um, activists, so these are the folks that feel the environment's at a critical stage, we must act now, they're willing to compromise lifestyle in, in order to help improve um, climate change, the environment. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, they tend to represent all age demographics. So they do screw female, um, but they're not over indexing on younger generations by any means. Um, activists are also willing to take action on social issues, as I mentioned before. So whether it's inequality in the mar marginalization of groups, they feel like it's critical to act, they'll over index on um, fighting social injustice, as well as being willing to protest organizations that practice unethical behavior. So on the G side of things as well. When we look at pragmatists, uh, again, they're boomers, so they skew older, they skew female, um, and they're not typically constrained by financials. So they under index on coming from low income households. And when we look at some of the other pillars of ESG, um, you know, they are higher on that societal side of things. They do feel like, you know, we're all in this together. Um, they, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, when it comes to sustainability, they're, they're doing the, pragma the pragmatic things like recycling. Um, but 
they're also not constrained financially and so they'll say i'm willing to pay more um you know, in this case the, the examples of apparel and footwear but across categories willing to pay more for products that are ethical and sustainable so we expect they're going to be similar when it comes to social issues when it comes to government governance issues um you know doing the the pragmatic things and again that may be um when it comes to governance issues, less likely to be protesting, but maybe more likely to be out voting um, or voting, um, you know, as shareholders, given that they tend to have more investments as well. Uh, if we move on to conflicted contributors, so again, these are the folks they want to make a change, but they are financially stressed. And so if we look at the inflation risk groups, we mentioned they're on the higher side. Um, if we look at uh, generations or their age profiles, they tend to skew a little bit older as well. Um, and the, the same carries through in terms of their attitudes towards the S and the G. So they feel powerless when it comes to solving the big problems facing the world. Um, they're more concerned about personal finances. They feel that their needs and the needs of their family are going to come first. Uh, and they feel inequality is a problem, but it's not as big as other issues. Uh, and likely those issues are going to be around rising prices, inflation, um, interest rates, housing affordability, and some of the things that we started off talking about. Uh, then we get to busy bystanders. So they tend to be younger, as I mentioned, young professionals. They are more likely to have kids in the household, more likely to um, be working in professional careers. Um, and they tend to feel the same um, about other issue, other uh, ESG issues as they do about sustainability. So they, their priorities lie elsewhere um, and they're still feeling guilty uh, about the, um, the impact uh, or how little impact they're making in terms of improving the environment in other areas. So they'll agree that you know companies worry too much about laws and regulations instead of just getting things done. Uh, you know, part of that busyness, um, there a lot of them will work in corporate government, uh, corporate institutions. Um, they feel guilty about how little they, little they contribute to the society. Um, they feel the government should focus on the economy, even at the cost of growing inequality. Um, and they feel that uh, inequality and marginalization are a problem, but that there are other priorities that um, just take precedence. So consistent with how they feel about the environment as well. Um, but again, may be able to tap into this group um, by making things easy and accessible. And then finally, disengaged denialists. Uh, we mentioned they actually skew younger, so not what we might have thought. Um, and uh, when we look at some of the other SNG statements, they're equally likely to not be taking action here as well. So just, you know, the, the picture kind of de defines it here. Um, they feel like social injustice and inequality are important, but are overstated. They feel that no group needs to take action to improve the lives of people in society. They're more likely to feel like no group needs to take action on improving the environment. And they're more likely to feel like no group needs to take action to improve how laws and regulations are followed. Now, you know, all those numbers still relatively on the smaller side, you know, 15 to 20 percent, um, but still significantly over indexing relative to all other Canadian groups um, in terms of feeling that way. OK, so those are our segments. Um, I'm going to pause because I did see a couple questions pop up at the end to address some of those questions, um, but I want to close just by providing um, some thoughts on a few different ways that you can leverage ESG segments for your organization. Um, three ways to be specific, to keep it uh, tight. Um, the first one is, you know, use the segments to help socialize ESG internally. So there's, you know, I started up by talking about, you know, there's, there's a lot of confusion around ESG. You know, Canadians care, but are they willing to do something? How much do they care? How much do they care to, relative to other priorities? Well, it becomes a lot clearer and the priorities become a lot clearer when we look at those questions in the context of segments. Um, the second thing is you can add segmentation to your custom studies. Uh, so whether it's our segmentation or you have a segmentation with another vendor, we encourage you to start including those in uh, your custom studies. If you're using an Ipsos segmentation, um, this one is free to include in your studies uh, other than the questionnaire space. 
the typing tools available. So um, you can include it, you can type your, uh, your respondents and whether that's a branding study or a shopping journey study, it'll help give you another lens in terms of how to interpret the data with respect to ESG. And the third thing is you can get regular updates on segment size and behavior. So I mentioned we've been running this since February 2021. We have all sorts of data in our syndicated study um, around a number of topics, whether that's the you know, workplace issues, um, the economy, health and wellness, um, category shopping, omni-channel behaviors. We can look at all of those by the sustainability segments and we have, um, and again, we have that data available as part of our syndicated study. So that's something that you can get access to as well. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, hopefully you found it valuable. Hopefully you learned something about uh, the segments. Um, we're here to help. So I'll leave my email up there. If you have any questions after we get through the questions that are coming through, feel free to shoot me a note. Um, I'll pop over to the question tab and see if we can address some of these. Question around, um, do we have insights to understand the say do gap by segmentation? Um, are activists willing to pay more for sustainable products messaging? Uh, so we we do have um, information about the say do gap uh, by segments. Um, it is similar to as you might expect. Um, the gap is smaller when it comes to activists and pragmatists, um, and actually largest when it comes to uh, your busy bystanders because they do say that they care the most, but they're also, um, you know, less likely to take some of those actions. Uh, so it does it does matter. Um, another question here. They said the base for Gen Z. Um, is low for some questions. So I mentioned this is a global segmentation. Um, we run it in 15 different countries. So we gather data on them quarterly across a sample of 10,000 um, respondents globally. So the sample size, the data for today I pulled out was for Canada uh, to give you guys more of a local context, but we do um, have larger sample sizes that we um, vet all the segment data by. Uh, and it's been pretty consistent. So, um, yeah, just to, to say that we can we can back that up globally as well. Um, another question here about why do we think that the numbers are lower for Canada than for the U.S.? Um, so that's an interesting question. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a number of reasons why we see government performance, uh, corporate performance being lower um, in Canada than um, than in the U.S., uh, particularly when it comes to brands and manufacturers and when it comes to retailers. Um, we tend to have a more center-left government and center-left media that focuses on things like corporate profits and corporate taxation. So that tends to be a little bit more in the Canadian zeitgeist of what people are, um, are consuming. So I think that drives it a little bit. Um, we also saw, you know, sort of, a, and this is globally, but, you know, perhaps more in Canada, uh, that during the pandemic, uh, companies, brands um, got a bit of a lift. They were seen as um, responding really favorably. Uh, companies were, uh, you know, doing the things that they needed to do to help keep Canadians safe, uh, whether that was providing information or providing safe places to shop, um, moving to digital and um, uh, digital fulfillment, delivery, uh, curbside pickup, all of these things really garnered a lot of goodwill um, with Canadians. And so post pandemic, there's really no place to go but down. And so once we started getting into um, inflation, rising interest rates, uh, higher prices, that really impacted um, perceptions in Canada uh, more than in other places, as I mentioned, because Canadians were more financially impacted um, because of our higher debt load than in other places. And so I think that is part of the reason as well for, that we send to see those, those numbers be lower. Um, quick time check. So uh, I'll answer one more and then we'll wrap it up. Um, one more question came through, why do we feel like uh, younger generations are more likely to be disengaged denialists 
Um, also an interesting question, you know, we have some hypotheses around that. I don't have the clear answer, uh, but one of the hypotheses um, is related to life stage. You know, there's a lot uh, going on for young people. And so they, you know, environment has not been a priority. Um, but I think similarly, I mentioned the disengaged denialists aren't just folks that, you know, don't believe the environment's a concern within that group, there's also those that feel, you know, the environment is important, but it's just too late to act. Um, and uh, that's probably more um, consistent with how younger people are feeling. There's more fatalism um, around, you know what? Yeah, the environment is a concern, but it just doesn't matter what I do. Um, so there's a little bit of, um, of that as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I have my own hypotheses around the way younger people consume media, uh, not vetted by data, but I'll share it anyways. Um, you know, I think there's also a bit of an echo chamber, so they're less likely to get news from traditional sources, more likely to get news from social media, um, or news feeds, which give them the news that they're looking for. And if you're not looking for news about climate change, the environment, um, on those channels, you're not going to get it. And so, um, older generations may be having just more access to information about climate change because they're um, using more mainstream channels uh, for their news. So, um, and that's about it. We'll end it there. Uh, if you have any questions, um, outstanding that you think of later, jot down my email. I'm happy to respond and answer questions. Um, the recording will be available tomorrow. Uh, so if you want to share with others in the organization, um, you can go to the registration page and we'll have uh, the recording of this session and all the previous sessions that Ellen mentioned at the beginning. Um, and finally, just thanks to everybody for, for joining and taking the time today. I really appreciate you listening in uh, and hopefully it was insightful. So thanks everyone and uh, have a good rest of the afternoon. Take care.